You're listening to the Informal Bible Study, a casual and applicational look at the Scriptures. I'm John Stonge, and it's great to have you with us today. In just a few moments, we're going to be looking at Romans chapter 7, verse 7 down to verse 25, and we're going to be asking the question, why do I do what I don't want to do? But let me share just a couple quick things with you before we get underway. First off, I want to invite you to visit our website, which is desirejesus.com. And on our website, there's one primary action I want you to take this week if you've never done so, and that's this. I want you to sign up for our weekly newsletter. Each Tuesday, I put out a newsletter. It's free, and it's just a word of encouragement, just something brief that I like to send to your inbox. And it also includes a devotional and links to anything new that we've posted on the website. So if there's new blog content or new podcasts or whatever it may be, you'll find the links to that in the newsletter. And I usually send that out on Tuesday afternoon, so if you're not on our email list, be sure to sign up for that because several times during the year there's also some free books that I like to send out to those on our email list as well. The link to the most recent free book that I sent out was a link to the book, Who is God?, which is the newest book that I've written. It's available in our bookstore at DesireJesus.com, and it's an encouraging study of God's nature and attributes and transformative work in our lives. If you haven't picked up a copy yet, I'd encourage you to check it out. It's available as, a, as an e-book, or you can order a paperback copy, but that's available there. And since it's still early in the new year, we also have a one-year devotional called The the Desire Jesus One Year Devotional. And that's a 365-day devotional that was written with the goal of encouraging and refreshing and strengthening your daily walk with Christ. And again, that's available in both paperback or in ebook editions. And so you can find all of that at desirejesus.com. But again, if you're not part of our weekly newsletter list, be sure to sign up for that. It's free. You'll see the link for it right there on our website, desirejesus.com. Well, I hope you're having a great week so far. I know that as you're listening to this recording, it's early in the week. I release these podcast episodes on Mondays. And today we're taking a look at a portion of Scripture from Romans chapter 7, starting with verse 7, that talks about this idea of doing things that we don't want to do. Now, I know that we've all found ourselves in that kind of uh, context in our day-to-day lives where we find ourselves either saying things or thinking things or acting on things that we know we don't want to do, and yet we find ourselves doing these things anyway. Well, why is that? Why does that dilemma take place in our lives? Or why is there that kind of difference between what our heart motivations are at times and what our actions actually seem to complete? Well, this portion of Scripture talks about that, and it talks about what our real motivations are, and it talks about the battle that's taking place within us. So if you would, take your Bibles and open up to Romans chapter 7. Again, we're going to start with verse 7 today, and we're going to look down to verse 25 as we answer the question, why do I do what I don't want to do? We resumed our study of the book of Romans last week, and today we're going to be looking at Romans chapter 7, starting with verse 7. So uh, essentially the the next two-thirds of uh, chapter 7 of the book of Romans, and we're going to be talking about this idea, and maybe this is a question you've asked yourself from time to time, but why do I do what I don't want to do? Have you ever asked yourself that question? Why do I do what I don't want to do? It seems so illogical. Well, when we look at this portion of Scripture today, it gives us the root reasons why that often ends up being the case. So if you would, take your Bibles and turn with me to Romans chapter 7, and we'll start with verse 7, and I'm going to read right down to verse 25. Romans 7, starting with verse 7, this is what it states. What shall, or what then shall we say? That the law is sin? By no means. Yet, If it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin, for I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me. 
and through it killed me. So the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin producing death in me through what is good, in order that sin might be shown to be sin, and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being. But I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your word, and thank you for granting us the privilege to be able to look at this portion of Scripture today. And Lord, as we look at this portion of your word, we can see a lot of things here that really resonate with us, because this is the type of dichotomy or the kind of battle that takes place in our minds as we wrestle with the nature of sin and the presence of sin in our lives. And we find ourselves asking ourselves uh, the question, why do I do what I don't want to do? And Lord, that's the concept that's addressed in this portion of your word. And so we pray that we would understand more about what's going on behind the scenes as we look at a portion of Scripture like this. And as you give us insight into what's going on behind the scenes, we pray that we'd also be convinced that your Son, Jesus Christ, is the remedy. And so we commit this time to you, Lord, and we're grateful for the privilege to be able to look at your word together today. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. So a few years ago, I received a call from a friend. And uh, it was a call I had been waiting for, but it was a, a very sad call to receive nonetheless. In the weeks prior to him calling me, he had been caught in an affair. And that information was all just starting to come to light. And so as you could probably imagine, there was a lot of fallout uh, related to that affair. Uh, a lot of fallout that came from that kind of decision that he had made. His wife was devastated. His children were furious. His reputation was damaged. And there was a moral clause in his contract that meant he would now lose his job, lose his income, and lose his house. So life was obviously going to look quite different for him. And when the phone call finally came and uh, we were able to talk to each other, he said something to me that I am 100% certain, as long as my mind works, that I will never forget. He spoke four words, and he, he said these words with such grief and such pain in his voice that at times when I think back to that conversation and I replay those words in my mind, I could find tears kind of welling up in my eyes because there was so much emotion behind what he was saying. And, and as I replay it in my mind, I can still hear the inflection in his voice. But in the midst of the smoking rubble and everything that was, was taking place all around him, he said this to me, four words. He said, what have I done? That was his question. What have I done? He was devastated. He was filled with regret. Now, thankfully, in the years since these events occurred, there's been repentance on his part and reconciliation with his family. And so I'm grateful to see the Lord uh, reconciling what had been damaged and restoring what had been damaged. But when, you, when I tell you just the bare details about that man's experience, maybe your experience in life um, isn't exactly along the same lines as what this man decided to do or the direction that he went in with his life. 
But I wonder, can we identify with this man's experience on some level? And what I mean by that is this. Have you ever made a regretful decision or tried to live your life outside of the will of God only to look back at what you had decided with great confusion over what you could have possibly been thinking in that moment when you made those choices. Have you ever had an occurrence or an experience like that during the course of your life where you look back and you're like, what was I thinking? Why did that make sense to me in that moment? You know, why, why was this not something that, that was clearer to me in the moment like it's clear to me now? I think we all probably have experiences like that. I think that we could all probably point to something in our life that we could look back and say, I was not, I feel like I wasn't in my right mind when I made those decisions. I don't know why I did that or why I said that or why that occurred, but it occurred and now there's regret. Even though we know Christ, we can still very easily make poor decisions, particularly if we're treating the tempting influence of sin way too casually. Or if we actually think, and I've met people like this that seem to think that they're at a season of their life where they are beyond being tempted. And I think to myself, really? I actually think that the devil loves when people think that because all you've done is you've you've put your guard down. You've made yourself think, you know, I guess I'm just the one person on earth that isn't susceptible to sin. I think that's a big mistake. And a lot of times we can find ourselves in a spot where if we're treating the presence of sin too casually, it's like we're setting ourselves up for a big fall. But why do we do what we don't want to do? Now, I just read this portion of Scripture from Romans chapter 7, and we'll revisit those sections a piece at a time as we look at this. But I want to suggest several things that are really just referenced here in Romans chapter 7, starting with verse 7, that tell us why we do what we don't want to do. And one of the first things is this. Sin deceives us. Look look again at what it says in verse 7. And I'll read a few of the verses following that. But it says, What then shall we say? That the law is sin? By no means. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin, for I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, You shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. And then Paul says in verse 9, I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me. And through it, killed me. So the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Let's pause there for just a second. So, We've been going through the book of Romans for several months. We took a little bit of a pause for for several weeks, uh, but we've resumed here looking at this book. And when you go through the book of Romans, the book of Romans is a very theologically rich book. There's a lot of details in the book of Romans, and certainly many details that we won't have time uh, during the course of our, our study here on Sunday mornings to look at. I think if we looked at every single detail, theologically speaking, of what's contained in this book, it would honestly take us several years to be able to go through it. So I certainly hope you'll follow up on some of these things in your own time. But one of the things that you could see as a theme that the Apostle Paul brings up is the role of the Old Testament law. Now we saw that last week when we started looking at Romans chapter 7. We've seen that elsewhere as we've been looking throughout the course of this book. But as he did in previous chapters, you have Paul here continue to speak about our relationship to the Mosaic law. The Mosaic law, by the way, which was revealed in the first five books of the Old Testament. And in those scriptures, we learn many important things. We learn that God created us without sin, uh, and that God created us free to live in a perfect relationship with Him. And things were well, and things were good, and things looked like He wanted them to be. In fact, He declared things very good. And that all changed when Adam rebelled against God. And from that moment, sin entered the human race. And the law, when you look at the law that the Lord revealed to Moses, it reveals the fact that God is holy, and God is just, and we are sinful. So it talks about God's holiness, and it talks about man's sin, and it shows the difference between these two things. And it specifies what actions of our hands or intentions of our hearts are sinful. The law itself is not sinful. But what does the law do? 
It reveals my sin to me. It reveals your sin to you. And God designed it to do that. And so Paul uses himself as an example of how the law reveals sin. He speaks of the sin of coveting, right? That's the example that he uses in, this, in the verses I just reread a moment ago. He speaks of the sin of coveting, and he says this. He says, For I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, You shall not covet. Now, apparently, this was an area of sin that Paul admittedly wrestled with, and he also admitted that when he read the Scriptures, particularly the Scriptures that are telling him, Paul, don't covet. He said he felt provoked to rebel against that instruction. I won't, uh, I won't tell on my, my children uh, as I say this, but this occurred to me. I remember uh, some time ago one of my kids saying to me, um, I, I said, why did you do that? And they admitted to me that the reason that they did something was because I had told them not to do that thing. I was like, wait, you specifically did it because I told you? And it's like, yes, you're always telling us not to do stuff. So I was like, eh, I want to do that. You tell me not to do, I'm going to do it. And, you know, part of me was like, yeah, I get that, right? And do you think the Apostle Paul, when you read these verses, would be like, yeah, I guess I kind of get that. Because what does he say? The Lord says, hey, Paul, don't covet. And what does Paul say goes on within him? Don't covet. Please, you haven't seen coveting until you see the kind of coveting I can do, right? It's like the commandment provokes us. There's nothing wrong with the commandment. And yet when we hear the commandment, we're like, huh, I wonder why he says don't do that. I guess I'll find out the hard way. I think I should find out the hard way. Let me just make my life miserable, and then I'll be like, oh yeah, I shouldn't covet, right? And that's the example Paul uses here. Admittedly, this was probably an area that he was wrestling with, and he felt provoked when he would hear that instruction. And what he says happened was his sin nature would seize the opportunity to egg him on to covet in response to the clear teaching of God's Word. Again, does that not sound familiar? Can we relate to that? I can relate to that. When I look at that, I'm like, yeah, I can relate. And I bet you we all can if we're honest, right? What does Scripture tell us about the activity of Satan? Think for just a moment about what Scripture tells us Satan is up to, what he does, and what he's actively seeking to do in the lives of those who call on the name of Christ. We're told that Satan seeks to do multiple things, but two of those things that he likes to do is he likes to devour people, and he likes to deceive people. He likes to devour and deceive. He's happy to ruin your life. He's happy to try and ruin my life. He's happy to try and ruin the lives of anyone that walks the face of this earth. He devours, he deceives. And since mankind joined him in his rebellion, we struggle with some things. We struggle with internal and external factors that influence us to sin. Scripture tells us that the world, and, you know, so that's all the things going on around us, and then all the things going on within us, so the world and our own sin nature and the devil all tempt us to go in the opposite direction that the Holy Spirit is seeking to lead us. In fact, one of the very helpful portion of Scripture that illustrates this is from James 1. So let me read that to us. In James 1, verse 13, down to verse 15, it says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. Now let me pause there for a second. Do you ever? I, we blame God for everything, don't we? We blame Him for everything, right? Whenever something goes wrong in our lives, we blame Him for stuff that He has no fault in. And so you have James here saying, when you're tempted, don't say, I'm being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. And then in verse 14 of James 1, it says, but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. So that's what James reveals in that portion of Scripture, an extremely practical book in Scripture revealing to us things about ourself and and things about the way we relate to God. Now, the law of God is holy. There's nothing wrong with the law of God. But sin is a deceitful liar. And so one of the reasons we do what we don't want to do is because we're deceived by the false promises of sin. I have been deceived by the false promises of sin in my life. 
you have been deceived by the false promises of sin in your life. Because what sin does is it likes to paint a very pretty picture. And it shows us what, what, what things are going to be like if you, just kinda, if you just give in to whatever area of temptation you're struggling with at any given moment. But it conveniently leaves out the long-term consequences of what's going to come uh, for giving into that sin or into that temptation when we compromise our convictions. And when we say yes to things that we shouldn't be saying yes to, and when we start saying no to the leading of the Holy Spirit. So sin makes all these false promises that have to do with short-term benefits, but it always seems to leave out the long-term consequences that come from giving into it. And what the, the deceitfulness of sin likes to do is it likes to relegate the Lord to an afterthought in our minds, so that the Lord's not on the forefront of our minds, that he, He's kind of relegated back to a compartment somewhere in the back of our minds, or we try not to think about Him at all in any given moment like that. And the deceitfulness of sin influences us to forget that there will be a day when our lives are laid bare before God, and we will give an account to Him for how we use the time that He blessed us with and how we use the life that He blessed us with. We will give an account before Him, but admittedly, in the midst of our moments of, of, of weakness or temptation, that's the furthest thing from our mind. We don't want to think about that. We just want to give in to whatever momentary pleasure seems appealing in a given moment. And isn't it interesting how we can know these things factually? And we could dwell on these things from a factual perspective and yet still find a way to violate our conscience and still find a way to ignore the voice of the Holy Spirit when He speaks to us. And I think, particularly if you're someone who professes to love Jesus Christ, I think that this is a confusing dilemma for us. It's confusing, isn't it? Doesn't it seem perplexing? Because in one moment, you feel strong in your faith. And Christ feels like He's at the forefront of your mind, in the forefront of your life. And then in another moment, you're like... I'm just going to go in this direction for a little while and see where it takes me. And then you deal with the regret and you're like, why did I do that? What was I thinking? Sin deceives us. And I think it's confusing. And I think in the midst of that, we could struggle to understand our own actions. And in fact, that's what the Apostle Paul says next as we look at this next section here. One of the reasons why we do what we don't want to do is that we don't understand our own actions. Look at what he says in verse 13. Let me read verse 13 and some of the verses following that. But he says this, and by the way, notice even as he's verbalizing these things, kind of the back and forth that's going on in his mind. Like even in the way these things are phrased, it's phrased this way on purpose as the Holy Spirit inspired him to pen these things down. But I think that even in the phrasing, you can see that there's this dilemma that the Apostle Paul's wrestling with, and it illustrates the dilemma that we wrestle with as well. We don't understand our own actions. Verse 13, he says, Did that which is good then bring death to me? So he's referring to the law. He's saying, Did the law bring death to me? He says, By no means. It was sin producing death in me through what is good, in order that sin might be shown to be sin, and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions. Let me repeat that, verse 15. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh, for I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. I think that's a fascinating paragraph from Scripture. And I think you almost have to read it slower than I just read it to fully appreciate what the Apostle Paul is saying. And you almost have to take it like a sentence at a time, get the thought in your head, and then you move on to the next sentence. But I think it, it could be a challenging thing. He's encouraging introspection here by using himself as an example. But I think it could be a challenging thing for us to come to an accurate understanding of ourselves. I think that part of our spiritual maturity and part of our social maturity 
It involves developing a deeper, like a deeper understanding, a deeper knowledge of our motives, our self-protective strategies, and all that contributes to the actions that we, that we choose to carry out. But even as we grow in these areas, we still puzzle ourselves. You know, I've often asked myself, why on earth did you do that? Or why on earth did you say that? And sometimes I don't have a good answer. It's funny, in this, you know, so often I'll find myself using my wife as my filter. It's like, should I say that? Should I not say that? You know, it's like, should I have phrased that differently? And she gives me good counsel in that area. Because a lot of times, sometimes it'll be something we do. Sometimes it'll be something that we say. And then afterward, we'll go back and we'll say, why did I do that? And a lot of times we don't feel like we have a good answer. Well, Paul reveals in this portion of Scripture that one of the reasons we do what we don't want to do is because we don't understand our own actions. There's nothing wrong with the commandments of God. Commandments of God are fine. The commandments of God are perfect. The commandments of God are spiritual, the Scripture tells us. There's nothing wrong with the will of God. God's will is absolutely perfect. But there is something wrong with this world. This world and all who live in it experience the effects of being under a curse. That's what we experience in this world. We experience the effects of being under a curse. Sin is rampant here. And even after we come to know Christ, we're still involved in a daily battle against sin's influence in our lives. Look at what it tells us in Genesis chapter 3. In Genesis 3 verse 17, it says, "'Cursed is the ground because of you,' In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. And so this is after Adam and Eve rebelled against the Lord. And this earth was cursed. This earth remains under a curse even now. And in Romans chapter 8, it speaks of the day when that curse is lifted, but it tells us that in the meantime, it says that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. So right now, what state is this creation in? It's in a bondage to corruption. It's under a curse. That's what's going on around us. That's, that impacts what's going on within us. And so even though we become a new creation through faith in Jesus Christ, sin is still present all around us. Sin is still present within us. And it likes to operate like a cruel master. And it doesn't give up control over our lives or its influence over us very easily. It doesn't want to give that sort of thing up over me or over you or over any of us. But there's a tension in our lives that wasn't there before we came to know Christ. Once we came to know Christ, a tension was built. And it's a healthy tension, and it's a tension between our old nature and our new nature. The old nature we were born with and the new nature we were reborn with. And these two things are doing battle within us. And you and I find ourselves in a spot sometimes that it's so confusing because in one given moment, you'll be living in the new nature. And you'll be glorifying Christ with your mind and with your life and with your actions and with your words. And then in another moment, you'll find yourself gravitating toward the old nature, where the Lord is just an afterthought in your mind. And that's the tension that's taking place right now. Our old nature is egging us on to ignore God's voice. Our old nature is egging us on to rebel against God. But our new nature, directed by the Holy Spirit, desires to live in the light of Christ. So it's a bit of a dilemma. Do you experience that same dilemma? You know, as Paul's talking about this here in this portion of Scripture, you've experienced this, right? Isn't this the struggle that we, I mean, we experience this daily, if we're really honest. Some days worse than others, but this is something we're battling with on a daily basis. And again, like I said a few moments ago, even the way these phrases are written here in the Scripture, even the way these verses are written down, I think that they intentionally are, are written this way to illustrate this baffling confusion that we wrestle with in our minds. Because it seems like Paul's going back and forth, and, and he's like, you know, the things I want to do, I don't do, and I don't do the things that I want to do. And he keeps like going back and forth, and we're like, wait a second, wait, what did he say? What, what, how many times did he say the word do here? And I'm like, going back and forth, looking at it, and I, I, I chuckle every time I read this portion of Scripture, not because it's a light subject, but because you could tell that Paul was wrestling with these things, even as the Holy Spirit penned, or inspired him to pen these things down. It's a back-and-forth way that he speaks here, uh, illustrating both sides of this. Look at verse 15 again. He says, For I do not understand my own actions. 
For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. And then when you jump down to the second part of verse 18, he says, For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the, uh, for I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Just a fascinating way to phrase all of this. But again, our own sin, what does it do? It puzzles us. Because as we stand now, we're not finished becoming what God has ordained us to become. You're in process, and I'm in process, as the Lord is accomplishing a work in our lives. The moment we trusted in Jesus Christ, Scripture tells us that we were declared righteous by God. We were justified in the eyes of God. And now from there, we're going through this gradual process, this gradual experience of being sanctified, where we're growing in holiness, where you and I, we're making progress. None of us is perfect yet. We're making progress. We're growing spiritually mature. We're growing in holiness. It's a sanctifying process that the Lord is bringing each of us through as we trust in Him. And during this process, sin loves to still creep in, and it likes to pervert what God is attempting to orchestrate. Now, the day is coming when you and I are going to be glorified in God's presence, and we're going to be made perfect, and we'll be given a brand new body, and we will no longer struggle with sin, nor will our old nature be present. You're not going to have your old nature forever. You have it for right now, but you're not going to have it forever. In this sanctifying process, we have it. But when we're glorified with our new bodies in the presence of God forever, we won't have it. So in eternity, when we receive these things, we'll be sinless and we'll experience the full effects of our salvation. But for now, we're in the battle. For now, we're in the process. By the way, be patient with yourself. You're in the midst of a process. Any person you've ever met that thinks that they're perfect is lying to themselves. Don't be one of the people that that lies to yourself. Don't lie to yourself. You're in process. If you goof up today, I'm not saying that it's okay, right? We don't want to goof up and just be like, ah, whatever. We don't treat it casually, but understand what's actually taking place. You're in process. You haven't fully arrived yet. Show yourself some mercy. Show yourself some grace in the midst of it, because it's ultimately the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. And the Lord encourages us to be people who joyfully repent before Him. And He invites us to to know that it's safe to do so. And He invites us to walk away from the things that we've been giving into. But in the meantime, we're in process. I'm in process. You're in process. And the day's going to come when we'll be glorified forever in His presence. But we're not there yet. We're being sanctified right now. How's your battle going? <laughs> How's it going? You know, are, are you convinced that the day is going to come when you'll experience true victory over sin? Or do you find yourself getting so frustrated with the back and forth nature of these things that there are times that you feel like just throwing in the towel and saying like, you know, what? I think I'm done. I've tried. I keep messing this up. The truth is if we're relying on our own strength, if we're relying on our own willpower to try and somehow obtain victory over sin, we're going to quickly discover that that doesn't work. We're going to be frustrated. My willpower, my own strength is not sufficient in this kind of battle, and neither is yours. But there's a word of assurance right here at the last section of Romans 7 that I want us to see. And we should notice it, and we should find confidence in it, because what it's telling us is that our ultimate deliverance from this struggle That comes through Jesus Christ. Look at what it tells us in verse 21 down to the end of the chapter. It tells us that we could be thankful that Jesus has delivered us. Look at verse 21. It says this, So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man, that I am. Who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. 
don't know if you're paying attention to the news this past week. I saw a news story that was, uh, I, it was both tragic and joyful at the same time. Apparently, I guess it was back in October, there was a teenage girl in Wisconsin. Did anyone see this? Does anyone know what I'm about to refer to? Some of you did see this. I saw this this past week. There was a teenage girl in Wisconsin. Uh, a man uh, broke into her house, killed both of her parents, and took her captive. And for the past three months, people had no idea what had happened to this girl. They had no idea where she was, what had happened to her. All they knew is that her parents were dead, and she was missing for three months. And then the other day, you know, so she's being held captive against her will, apparently, what had, is what had been happening by this guy that had killed her parents. And the other day, and I still haven't heard how it transpired, but somehow she got out. She went outside, and she went to where she saw somebody walking her dog, and she told the person who was walking her dog what had happened, and they went and got help, and then they found the guy who had taken her captive, and he's now in prison. But I look at that, and I thought, okay, well, obviously that's a very tragic thing, but I'm grateful to God that that young girl was able to find freedom from her captivity. And that caught my attention for many reasons. Just the story on its own, I thought, was compelling to hear. But particularly when we look at a portion of Scripture like this that talks about our own captivity, I thought, wow, this is ironic. In my mind during the course of this week, in preparing to speak on these things today, one of the things that we've been seeing here in this portion of Scripture is the fact that it talks about us experiencing a very real captivity. Paul describes our captivity in these verses. He says it's a captivity to sin. Now imagine if that was a, a fate we were doomed to experience forever. You know, imagine if that kind of captivity was something that that was the only thing that you could look forward to from now until all time, a captivity to sin. I feel like um, I'm one of those people that thinks that I can live with a protective bubble around myself. It doesn't really work out that well. Uh, I'm one of those people that feels like captive when you meet a long hugger. Do you ever meet somebody that's a long hugger? I met somebody a few years ago that said to me, an older woman, she looked at me and she goes, just so you know, I'm a hugger. And I was like, oh, no. And now I'm about to sweat, you know, because she latched on. And this is, this is my part of the hug, you know, and, and, and she's holding on there. And do you ever experience something? You know who helps me get out of that? My daughter, Julia, helps me get out of that. When she was born, she said, Dad, she didn't say this in words, just with a look in her eyes, but she said, Dad, I know that you try and live your life with a protective bubble, but that's not really going to work for us. And so Julia is the long hugger that lives in my home now. Um, but you know, when, I, when you look at that, you know, particularly like, you know, if you feel like even a hint claustrophobic, you're like, give me my space, give me, like, give me freedom. Do you ever wear a shirt that's like, like, can anyone not wear turtlenecks because you feel like you're just going to die in one of those things because they're, they're going to choke you, right? Several of you, right? You know, and you're like, we don't like being... Um, compressed or like held in or whatever it may be. And I can't imagine if the only thing that we could look forward to was captivity. It's just being held captive, right? If that, was, if that was the outlook for the future that was all we could experience, that would be tragic. And thankfully, Christ has intervened. And that's what Paul's talking about here and praising God for. Christ is the solution to our wretched condition. You know, who delivers us from this body of death? Who's the one that delivers us from this captivity to sin? Well, we're delivered by God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. That's what Paul's saying here in this portion of Scripture. We still battle with sin, but we don't need to remain its captive forever. You're battling with it, and I'm battling with it, but we don't need to remain its captive forever. I want to finish with something that I think is easy to remember that I hope will be helpful to you. It comes from an article that was written several years ago, almost three years ago. But in 2016, there was an article written, Four Steps to Killing Nagging Sins. It's a compelling title, I think. Four Steps to, ki to Kill Nagging Sins. It was written by a man named Gavin Ortland. And you can actually find it on the desiringgod.org blog. Uh, it's still posted up there. But he suggested four biblical steps that I want to repeat for us today that I think are helpful. 
particularly if we've been struggling with nagging sins that have been sticking around for way too long. And it's really just four words that we have to remember. And, and his advice, rooted in Scripture, was this. He said, you know, if you want to kill nagging sin in your life, you need to hate it, starve it, corner it, and overwhelm it. Hate it, starve it, corner it, and overwhelm it. Well, what did he mean by those things? Well, what he was saying is don't minimize your sin and treat it like it's a pet to keep around. Hate it. It's like hate your sin. Don't minimize it. Hate it. Call it for what it is. It's an offense to the holiness of God. Call it for what it is. Don't treat it like it's a puppy. It's not a cute little puppy. It wants to bite you, right? It wants to hurt you. It's rabid. Hate it. Hate your sin. Then he says, uh, starve it. What does that mean, starve it? Simply, it's like, don't feed it. Like, if you have an area of temptation, don't feed that area of temptation. Starve that area of temptation. Don't put yourself in context where you know you're more likely to be tempted. Don't feed the things that ultimately are, are things that are an offense to the holiness of God. Don't feed it. Starve it. And then he says, corner it. And even before I, I, I read what he had to say about cornering it, I was trying to think in my mind, what does he mean by cornering it? What does it mean to corner it? And his thesis was this. He was saying, don't invite it to infiltrate every area of your life. Corner it. Don't welcome it into another area and another area and another area. Corner it. I was like, okay. And then his final piece of advice was to overwhelm it. And what he meant by that was this. He was saying, you know, don't falsely believe that the sin that you're struggling with is more powerful than Christ. Overwhelm that sin. Overpower it by the power of Christ. And I thought it was a helpful list of suggestions. You know, as he's encouraging us as people who love Christ, but yet we wrestle with our old nature, he's saying, listen, if you've got some nagging sin that's just sticking around in your life for way too long, hate it. Starve it. Corner it. Overwhelm it. So again, as we wrap up this morning, why do we do what we don't want to do? Well, we do these things because we've been deceived. We don't understand our own actions. But Christ has delivered us from the power of sin. And in Him, we're given the grace to overcome. And I want to finish with one more portion of Scripture for us this morning. Two verses from 1 John 5. Verses 4 and 5 where it says, For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. Our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Let's pray. Lord, thank You for Your Word. And we thank You for the privilege that it is to be able to look at Your Word together today and to Meditate on the things that you reveal to us in it. And Lord, we recognize that we are men and women who struggle with all sorts of things. Every single one of us gathered in this room, we're all in the midst of a battle. Lord, we know that the day is coming when we're going to be perfect in your presence. We're going to be glorified in your presence. We will no longer struggle with sin at that time. But right now, while we know we're justified, we've been declared righteous in your sight, and we also know, Lord, that when you see us, you see the righteousness of your Son, you see holiness and blamelessness, we also know that we're in the process of being sanctified. We're growing in holiness. Our maturity in our walk with you is growing. It's developing. So, Lord, we're not perfect yet. You're perfect. Your Word is perfect. But we are not perfect. Lord, we're grateful for the fact that even though we have moments where maybe we feel defeated by the things that we're wrestling with, we know that in your Son, Jesus Christ, ultimately we're not defeated. He has secured the victory on our behalf. And through your Son, we're given the privilege to overcome sin, to overcome the things of this world that try and pull us in a direction where we're ignoring the voice and the prodding of your Holy Spirit. 
So Lord, thank you for a portion of scripture like this that gives us a picture of what's going on behind the scenes and, and shows us why at times we, instead of listening to your voice, go in the complete opposite direction. Lord, we're sinners. We struggle with sin, but yet in your sight, we're justified. and You see us for what you're making us to be. You see the ultimate outcome. You know and can already see what we in our glorified state will look like and how we'll operate. But again, Lord, in this process, we know we need to remain reliant on you. We need to remain dependent on you. Our own willpower, our own personal strength isn't what's going to help us overcome our areas of temptation. It's through faith in your Son, Jesus Christ, that we're given the power to overcome. And so we pray that we would rely on the power that you supply through Christ, and that in the midst of our daily battles, that you would be our refuge, and that we would take encouragement, just as the Apostle Paul was finding encouragement, and he references it here in your word, reminding us that our deliverance comes through your Son. So thank you, Father, for delivering us through Christ, and thank you for your presence with us right now. We're grateful for these things, and we're grateful for these reminders from your word. Lord, thank you for confronting us with these things in a very edifying way. And Lord, we pray that you continue to build us up in our walk with you so that the things of this world that used to appeal to us so strongly would be things that we look at and we say, you know what, that doesn't even appeal to me anymore. I'm enamored with the person of Christ. I'm enamored with the righteousness of Christ. I want more of the righteousness of Christ in my life. I have seen that sin and Satan, they lie to me. Lord, help us to remember these things as we look at a portion of Scripture like this today. Thank you again, Lord, for your love and for the kindness that you show us that invites us to joyfully repent and to know that we're welcomed into your presence as we do so. We commit this day and this week to your care, and we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks again for listening to this episode of the Informal Bible Study. As I mentioned at the start of the episode, we'd invite you to stop by our website, which is desirejesus.com. Be sure to sign up for our weekly newsletter. And while you're on the website, be sure to check out our bookstore as well. We have lots of good resources there for you, including my newest book called Who is God? So be sure to check that out. I believe it'll edify and encourage you in your walk with Christ. But that's it for us today. Thanks again for listening. We hope you have a wonderful day and a wonderful week. And we look forward to catching up with you again right here next Monday. Take care. 